Um, this is the first of five uh, lectures on high performance computing and more specifically aspects of computing in lattice gauge theories. Uh, my name is Yanis Kutsu. I work at the Cypress Institute as an assistant professor where and specifically at its computational center which is also the national computing center of Cyprus. And uh, uh, just a bit of my background. So apart, I mean, uh, I work on high performance, computing, more specifically lattice QCD, and even more specifically uh, nucleon structure. Okay. Uh, right. So the outline of today's lecture is more of an introduction. So um, uh, this will be sort of uh, to introduce some. Um, concepts in high performance computing, um, some metrics that we use to measure performance, but also to give you a bit of a sort of introduction on supercomputers, some common components, and a bit the landscape in Europe and worldwide of uh, supercomputing in general. And then our third bullet point there is where I go a bit into more detail on some technical aspects and some introduce some uh, ways we some um, considerations we take when trying to optimize scientific codes try to measure the performance some simple performance models that are used and then I will outline a few uh, select optimization strategies that are sort of a bit high level and a bit descriptive for the moment but as we go on to the next uh, lectures, probably starting from lecture three, we will start getting, uh, let's say, our hands dirty and, and doing this in actual code. Um, okay, so I'd like to mo motivate you a bit why you should care if, uh, if that is even needed for this audience. But um, uh, one thing that um, is nowadays more true than ever is that um, High performance computing is intertwined with parallel computing. And just uh, to get a bit of the background on that, um, this plot is uh, pretty popular by now. Uh, and I'm sure you've all heard that the computers are becoming all the more parallel. And this is mainly new due to technological constraints. So, um, what is shown in this plot is some historical data of uh, trends in uh, micro pro microprocessor designs um, and uh, this uh, was originally uh, presented in 2010 but it's been updated since uh, you can find the data at this github page but uh, what what is uh, good to take a look at is that these orange triangles here which are thousands of transistors that can be put in a given uh, space or produced at a given cost. And this has been uh, growing exponentially with time. Uh, I know that the, this is logarithmic scale on the y-axis. And this is basically saying that, okay, Moore's law is more or less, uh, not in its original, as originally expected, but we can still uh, expect a, a, an exponential increase in transistor counts. Uh, but something other than Moore's law uh, has broken down since about 2006. So that's this breaking point here, which is that we lost the uh, Denard scaling. So Denard scaling basically tells you uh, what the power draw of uh, a given number of the transistors is given their area and their frequency and the voltage that is applied to it. Now this scaling law allowed us to, allowed uh, engineers to increase the frequency as the density of transistors got larger and therefore the volume, sorry, the area got smaller. But since about 2006, as I said, this, this scaling is broken down. And so one cannot expect this scaling to, uh, to hold anymore. And so uh, since, since the transistor count increased, what people have been doing, what engineers have been doing is duplicating logical cores on, uh, on a single die. And so you see that the frequency has flattened out, but the number of logical cores have increased. And so uh, to get any performance and any kind of uh, uh, efficiency 
out of uh, codes nowadays, you need to care about parallel processing. So as I said, exploiting parallelism is essential for scientific computing and you as practitioners of computational sciences benefit, would benefit from having some knowledge of concepts and challenges parallel computing. Um, and maybe I can break them down into three uh, components, let's say, that one needs to be aware of. The first is uh, the different computer architectures and their characteristics. So nowadays we hear about traditional Intel Xeon CPUs, for example, but then there's GPUs, there's um, uh, so-called ARM implementations of ARM architectures that are coming out that are uh, getting into supercomputers that we need to worry about. Uh, and also different kinds of GPUs are emerging now. Uh, and then uh, a practitioner, a computational scientist needs to care about algorithms, but particularly how amenable these algorithms are to be parallelized. So one has to know about common parallelization strategies. There's just some illustrative examples here of multi-grid domain decompositions and machine learning uh, algorithms here. But uh, what I want to uh, uh, highlight is that um, not knowing algorithms alone, but also knowing, having an in intuition of, of how amenable these are to parallelization will also guide you to, uh, to picking the right algorithm, let's say, or, or knowing what to expect about the parallel performance. And then there's performance metrics that a, a computational scientist should uh, keep in mind. Uh, things and, and their significance, things like sustained and peak floating point performance, bandwidth, scalability. So these are all uh, terminology that we will define in the next slides uh, and is part of this introduction, as I said before. Okay, so um, given the parallelism, uh, there is, uh, a, a question of how do we apply this parallelism and I'd like to make a distinction and um, this is common in the in, in let's say the high performance computing nomenclature to make a distinction between so-called capacity and capability computing. Um, these all refer to capacity and capability parallel computing. So uh, capacity computing is when uh, one improves the time to solution of a problem as said there that can also run on less number of processes. So you have a given problem that maybe runs on your workstation, maybe runs on two, four nodes, and uh, you have a specific problem that basically requires running thousands of instances of this. Then you would take it to a supercomputer, uh, but you would say that you're going to the supercomputer because it has capacity for solving your specific problem. So this is in contrast to so-called capability computing uh, in which uh, you use a supercomputer to solve a problem that would otherwise be impossible to solve on uh, less processes. So for example, um, you, if you have a problem size that cannot fit on any smaller system, then you would be seeking capability from, your, uh, from going to a supercomputer, that's what we would say. So uh, I'd like to point out also that um, sometimes capacity computing is termed high throughput computing um, to distinguish it from high performance computing. Some, some would argue that um, capability, HPC implies capability computing. Just want you to be aware of that distinction. Okay, and um, in the next slide, I'd like to introduce some concepts which maybe you've uh, heard about, but it's good to define them here um, and then more formally define them in the, in the next slides. So first of all, scalability is, uh, let's, I'd like to just formally define it here as the rate at which time to solution improves as we increase the number of processing units a problem is running on. And then one can distinguish between so-called weak scaling and strong scaling. So weak scaling is when we uh, increase the processing units and keep the so-called local problem size fixed. 
So what that means is that as we increase the number of processing units, we're also increasing the, the global problem size. And so how, uh, uh, so, so the, the rate at which uh, our performance improves as we uh, increase the processing units, in this case is called the how we refer to as weak skin. Strong scaling, on the other hand, is uh, the, well, so the opposite. So is when we increase the processing units, but we keep the global problem size fixed. So that means that um, as we uh, increase the number of processes, then the local problem size becomes smaller and smaller. And so I'd like to show you now some typical pictures that one sees when weak scaling is strong scaling some, some code. So it's not important exactly what uh, I'm plotting here, but uh, I can tell you uh, this is, this is um, a lattice QCD inversion on some uh, GPUs. Uh, and the different colors here are doing this in different positions. But what I want to point out is um, this is a typical good weak scaling. Okay, so the problem, local problem size is kept fixed. And then on the x axis here is the number of GPUs. And you see that the overall performance as we increase uh, the local problem size here is uh, measured in teraflops, is, is basically uh, uh, increasing linearly. And then on the next, on the, on the neck, on the uh, right side, uh, like there is, is the is this, is the same computational kernel, but here I am strong scaling it. So the the um, global problem size is fixed to uh, whatever z thirty two cube times ninety six, increasing the number of GPUs. So each GPU has less work to do, and in that case, what you typically see is uh, a, a tapering off of the performance because and we will see this in our next slide how this how we can formally let's say model the the strong scaling in order to see that as the the work that is done becomes less and less then overheads dominate and then you don't see an improvement when adding more uh, let's say processing uh, devices to the problem okay uh, just a bit more on the um, on introducing some concepts. So we said before scalability talks about it that it's the rate at which time solution improves as we increase processing units. And in fact, we can and should uh, quantify scalability uh, in terms of so-called speed up, uh, which is defined in this way. So it's just the ratio of the time to solution at some reference time divided by the time to solution when we use some number n of processes. And um, if we have perfect scaling, then the times to solution, to solution sorry, should have when we use twice the processes should, should um, uh, become a quarter of T0 when we use four times the processes. And so this should be linear. Uh, but there's a, a, a more uh, formal way to define uh, the uh, scalability by quantifying the divergence from scalability by so-called parallel efficiency, which is the scalability times the ratio of the number of processes used. And I think it's uh, pretty easy to see that ideal scaling implies that the efficiency at some number of processes is close to one. And what is good to point out here, just as a rule of thumb, uh, this, this is not formally said anywhere, but typically, where I say typically, I mean, for example, when you apply for computing time, um, then you, your application is considered to be uh, scalable if you can achieve uh, efficiency, which is bigger than some fraction and that fraction is usually set to 0 0.5. Um, so, so that's just a good thing to keep in mind when, when uh, we talk about scalability, about what, you know, uh, what typical computing centers that run supercomputers consider scalable algorithms which are acceptable for their systems. Okay. So another uh, concept 
another um, model, let's say, that is good to keep in mind is so-called Ampar's law, which introduces a simple model for uh, the expected scalability of some application. Um, so here we have um, uh, introduced a new, uh, let's say, parameter, uh, which is uh, the fraction of the application that can be parallelized. Now, this is not always obvious, but assuming that you know the fraction of the application that can be parallelized, or you can make some considerations as to what it is, then uh, given the type of solution of the code when using one process or a reference minimum number of processes and then the number of processes and you can uh, say that the time to solution is the fraction of the code that is uh, not scalable so that's one minus f times the reference time plus the fraction which is scalable over the times uh, uh, the reference time over the number of processes okay so this is a bit uh, trivial, uh, and then uh, maybe, uh, and then uh, if you uh, if you want to also compute the speed up, which is just the the inverse of this uh, uh, time to solution of n, and you arrive at something which has this dependence on f. And so you see um, this models to a very uh, crude approximation. Let's say this sort of models the strong scaling, maybe that we saw in the previous slide where I was showing you the strong scaling of the GPUs, where um, you see uh, uh, asymptotically that uh, as n goes to infinity, then this will become a constant and you, you stop getting uh, any speed up. So that's Amdahl's law and that's just uh, uh, one, um, one very, as I said, crude uh, approximation to how to model uh, uh, performance. Okay, now I, I'd like to talk a bit about some uh, performance metrics that we use. So we saw scalability before uh, as one metric that we use in uh, high performance computing to measure how well uh, parallel codes scale. Um, I'd also here uh, want to talk about uh, so-called uh, floating point rate and IO bandwidth, which uh, in the first case, floating point rate is defined as the number of floating point operations car carried out by a, a, a computational task per unit time. And so it's expressed as flops per second. And then there's a so-called IO performance or bandwidth, which is defined as the bytes read and written, usually both read and written per unit time. And it's good to distinguish between, so when you hear performance and bandwidth, distinguish between theoretical peak and sustained because theoretical peak is usually uh, an idealized um, quantity which assumes full utilization of hardware, whereas sustained is usually uh, uh, a performance that is measured, for example, by running a, an application on, on a supercomputer. Um, okay, we, we'll come to this later, but you, one thing to keep in mind that uh, usually a single floating point operation when you compute blobs is uh, uh, an addition, a subtraction or a multiplication and other operations are depend on the architecture, for example, the division, exponentiation, et cetera. Typically, they require more than one flop, and how many closing point operations they require is usually an architecture. Okay, and uh, another thing I'd like to introduce now is uh, a taxonomy of, let's say, how one parallelizes a given uh, operation. And uh, so, again, this is just to set some common language that we'll use later. So um, if you have um, uh, a stream of data and you have instructions that you, like operations that you do on those data, then uh, one can taxonomize the, the parallelization strategy uh, as to what is being parallelized, the operations uh, on the data, or do you have a single stream of data and you are using multiple operations? And so this uh, sort of two by two matrix, let's say, uh, 
creates this taxonomy of single instruction, single data, which is just a trivial case where you have no parallelism. And then these, the parallelism can come in multiple instruction streams with a single data dream, stream, MISD, as would be pronounced, single instruction stream, multiple data streams, which would be pronounced SIMD, and multiple instruction streams, multiple data streams, which would be um, uh, pronounced MIMD. MIMD yeah. And um, okay, just to get an idea, um, uh, as we go to specific examples in hardware, um, for example, most of the computing devices that you are familiar with uh, have underlying so called ZIMD units. So uh, GPUs, uh, CPUs, such as uh, Intel Xeons or ARM have underlying hardware which um, can operate on multiple data streams by issuing a single instruction. Whereas you can think of a supercomputer which is multiple compute nodes, so multiple of these GPUs and CPUs running in parallel as sort of MIMD machines where you know, not each node has to be doing the same instruction, so issuing the same instructions, and they don't necessarily be, need to be operating on multiple data. Okay, um, again, some basics introduction just to, um, uh, just to uh, clarify what we're talking about when we talk about a supercomputer. So the components uh, begin with, of course, the brains, which is compute nodes. Uh, and these usually, well, they, they almost exclusively have computational units and then potentially a coprocessor such as a GPU. There is some amount of memory. And then uh, uh, not, not always, actually, bigger supercomputers do not have, usually on the nodes, local storage, but might have some uh, fast uh, st um, uh, local storage uh, operating system, etc. And then uh, they usually have, they, they must have network interfaces uh, possibly separate network interfaces between uh, the internet you use for your scientific applications. So that's the workload uh, in, uh, network and for management like uh, booting the nodes, etc. Then another component is the interconnect and that's what makes this be a supercomputer that rather than a collection of nodes and this would uh, usually uh, consist of the interfaces on the nodes and then wiring and switches to uh, where all these, uh, uh, where, where the um, routing is done. And then storage is usually separate, is, is separate from uh, the compute nodes. Um, uh, nowadays, this is still predominantly spinning disks, uh, although uh, a lot of supercomputers and supercomputing centers are adding. Uh, faster drives, usually solid state drives between um, like the, the, the bigger storage, which is on, on hard disks, uh, they would have a, a smaller partition of solid state drives, which would be used for scratch space for faster IO. And then many supercomputers, uh, opt, uh, supercomputing sites, I should say, opt for tape systems. So uh, large, you know, uh, these, uh, robotic systems which uh, have tapes in them for long-term archiving. And of course uh, there are also front-end nodes or head nodes sometimes referred to which are the nodes that the user usually sees when uh, is accessing a supercomputer. These are the nodes that do the compilations and in jobs etc. Okay, as I said in the uh, last slide, the compute nodes um, uh, nowadays are equipped uh, with a core processor, which is typically a general purpose graphics processing unit. And it might be worth uh, uh, just outlining a bit what the main characteristics of each are. So uh, a CPU architecture is uh, mostly optimized for handling uh, 
a diverse range of instructions. So a, a range of instructions on multiple data. And usually what you see is larger caches per core, uh, smaller bandwidth to memory, but typically larger memory. So I'm talking about RAM here. Um, it relies predominantly on, let's, uh, on prefetching, which basically means predicting which data is needed so that it's read in to cache. And then there is some availability of, uh, of single instruction multi-data floating point units on the CPU architecture, whereas a GPU architecture is more optimized for throughput, where uh, throughput here I mean uh, applying the same operation on a, a large data stream. Um, and um, cores are defined loosely on a, on a, on a GPU. Um, usually it means uh, uh, the part of the GPU which ha has a distinct um, floating point unit. Um, and so the caches per each one of these so-called cores is, is much smaller than, a, the, than in the case of the CPUs. Um, what distinguishes is, another thing that distinguishes the GPU is higher bandwidth to memory, but typically smaller memory, and it relies on very wide single instruction multiple data units. So GPU architecture is optimized for, you give it a, a set of instructions and that same sequence of instructions should be applied to multiple data. And it might be worth just, so these are just block diagrams like they're cartoons, but if you look at a CPU and just, and a GPU and just uh, ask yourself what is the area of the device that is devoted to different units, then you see a large area on the CPU which is devoted to so-called control, um, and uh, some area here where the cores would be, which is devoted to these uh, ALUs, which are the, the units that do floating point operations, a relatively large cache and um, some memory, whereas uh, if I would just color with the same colors each component on the GPU, then you see that it's mainly a huge number of uh, smaller ALUs and a very tiny cache and control for each of these series of, of ALUs. Okay. So um, typical CPU architectures are the main characteristics that are found in nowadays supercomputers. So you may have heard these names. So you have Intel Xeon, uh, AMD Epic, are, uh, AMD is emerging again as a competitor in having their CPUs and supercomputers. These are uh, both so-called x86 uh, architectures. This refers to the instruction set used and now various ARM implementations are arising and also there are some uh, IBM power CPUs uh, uh, found uh, in, in supercomputers. So uh, CPUs typically have order 10 cores, so maybe you know, 32, 64, somewhere around there. Um, it might not be the current maximum, but as far as I'm aware of, on Hawk, think whether it's the epic cpus that the 64 has the largest time where of it now right now and then usually you have two or four of these cpus per up now the, the bandwidth to memory uh, is typically around 50 to 100 gigabytes per second and so you typically get theoretical peak floating point performance of around 30 and that's just ballpark 50 gigaplops per core, just to compare with the GPU architecture, where um, the most common uh, GPU architectures you find nowadays in, uh, in uh, supercomputers are NVIDIA Tesla, and now uh, also AMD Radeon are uh, emerging. So now we're talking about order 1000 cores, or more precisely, arithmetic and logical units, and you could find two to six GPUs per node in a typical supercomputer. The memory bandwidth is of the order of a terabyte, right? So that's uh, uh, one thing that distinguishes it from a, 
the CPU, as we said, that node and theoretical peak performance of uh, each GPU nowadays is in the tens of, of teraflops. So there is one technology that we don't know very much about, which might be worth noting. The Intel is also coming up with what they call a GPU. Um, this is announced for 2021, um, but uh, a lot of the details uh, are not really clear at the moment. So it, it looks like it will be similar to in design to uh, what we now call a GPU, but of course it, it will be for, for, um, for like supercomputing, right? So it won't be really uh, uh, intended for uh, graphics processing per se. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to talk a bit about the, uh, uh, a little bit of a side, side note to uh, talking a bit about um, the supercomputing landscape as it currently stands, just to understand what kind of systems are out there. And I, I can't do that without talking about this uh, top 500 list. So since, uh, uh, the 1990s, an organization has been uh, ranking supercomputers, the, the, the fastest 500 supercomputers, as you may know, uh, every two, twice a year, so annually. Uh, so there's one list that comes out in June and one list that comes out in November. And um, what you see here is uh, for every year, the uh, top system with blue, so the performance of the top system with blue, the performance of the top 10 systems with orange, and the sum of the performance of the first 100 systems with green. And what I'm plotting on the y-axis here in log scale is the petaflops, okay? And you can see that, for example, for the top system, you can see this, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit flat regions. That's when the system doesn't change over some period of time. Um, so what what um, what one can take from this is uh, well, first of all, uh, the top system is an ARM-based system. Uh, the second system includes uh, GPUs, and uh, the top in Europe also has GPUs. So this is a trend that has been uh, foreseen for some time now. Uh, the majority of systems in the top ten are equipped with some accelerator and in particular, uh, uh, GPUs. And um, it, it might be worth just to see the, the diversity of the solutions that are now uh, becoming uh, available also in Europe in terms of the different kinds of architectures and the different kinds of uh, you know, processing units that are available just to get an idea of uh, the kind of range of architectures available. So I've just compiled a, a list of the, I would say, so these are the, the, the top computers in Europe at the moment. Um, and I'll say a bit later about future plans, but uh, for example, in Italy, the, the, the biggest computer uh, has IBM power CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs, okay? So that's about 30 petaflops in P. And then there's Pistaint, um in Switzerland, which has Intel Xeon CPUs and NVIDIA P100 CPUs. Then there's a purely uh, Intel-based system at LRZ in Munich, which is a so-called SuperMOOC computer. And at JSC, uh, what we're seeing is the newest generation of uh, NVIDIA GPUs and Indian Xeon GPUs. Then we see uh, the first two systems here with uh, AMD EPIC CPUs. So one is in France and the other one is Hawk in uh, Stuttgart. Uh, and their peak performance of the one in Stuttgart is about 26 petaflops. So yet a third architecture in this case. And then Marin Ostrom uh, at uh, Barcelona, which uh, contains uh, uh, predominantly uh, Xeon CPUs, uh, but also has an ARM partition, a GPU partition, and an AMD partition. 
So this is just uh, to highlight the range of systems that are available in, in Europe. And these are predominantly the architectures that you have to worry about writing code for, right? Um, so one good thing is that in Europe, uh, these systems are also made available via a central centralized allocation process. Um, but uh, one thing that is, so this awards something between 10 to hundreds of tens to hundreds of million, that should be million, sorry, core hours for individual projects. And one thing that uh, is important to know that apart from scientific review of projects, what is typically required is a technical review. So you as uh, uh, an applicant have to show scaling and have to present some arguments about uh, the, the efficiency of your code, show that you have done some analysis to show that your, your code can indeed exploit the supercomputer that you're using. And so access to such resources requires a good understanding of HPC and the challenges for achieving efficient software implementation. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about a bit about the, the future. Um, so um, up until 2020, in Europe at least, uh, the strategies was that countries would procure the system using their own funds. And then EU would support projects such as Praise for the distribution of these resources. And the EU would also fund uh, prototyping, such as uh, some, sorry, some, proto some prototypes and hardware prototypes. And these are two examples of systems that have emerged from these prototyping. Uh, now, uh, somewhere around two, 2017, um, this strategy uh, shifted. And by 2020, we have the so-called Euro HPC joint undertaking, which is signed by the um, by uh, almost all of the member states, I think now, where the EU will co-fund uh, the procurement of supercomputers by consortiums of European states. And they have set specific goals. There should be three pre-exist jail systems deployed in 2021 and two exascale systems by 2022-2023. Now, uh, the architectures of these three pre scale systems are more or less known by now, and I want to talk a bit about them. Again, just to give you an idea of the kind of systems that are becoming available and type of architectures that we need to worry about now. So um, the first one is so-called Lumi. So this was just announced, I think, a week ago. It will be hosted in Finland. Uh, these are the partners, uh, the countries which are partners. And what they uh, settled on was uh, uh, a, a, a supercomputer manufactured by HP, HP Enterprise. And it will include AMD EPIC CPUs and also AMD GPUs. So this is a different uh, kind of GPU architecture. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the, uh, the, the, the CUDA framework that is used to write for NVIDIA GPUs. There's a different paradigm used here. Um, so that requires usually a third code base to be supported by a computational uh, scientists. So the peak, quite impressively, will be half, half an exaflop of the system. The second system that has been announced is uh, Leonardo, and this will be uh, deployed at Chinaka with these uh, four partners here. Um, this is um, uh, a bull system which will include Intel Xeon CPUs and uh, the latest Ampere NVIDIA GPUs and Will reach about 250 teraflops per second. And then uh, Mara Nostrum 5, uh, uh, we know the name, we know it will be deployed in BSC. I think it's not been announced yet exactly what the architecture is, uh, but it's highly likely that this will be, and that's just my assessment, but it's highly likely that it will probably be an Intel GPU architecture and they stated that they're targeting the 
people to earn their jobs. So, so that's the future in in Europe. What it's looking like, and uh, okay, just for comparison, maybe a, a slide of what it looks like in the US. So, this is the exascale roadmap. So, all the blue here are pre exascale, and the red are exascale systems, and uh, for uh, this uh, Perlmutter supercomputer at NERSC is currently being deployed. Uh, and the next expected one is uh, Aurora, which will be the first exascale system in the US and is expected to include Intel GPUs. Uh, but um, uh, what is probably worth taking out, taking from this, is that you see a similar mix as in Europe. Uh, so except, expect uh, significant performance in these systems from GPUs and actually three different architectures of GPUs. Okay, um, so that was this sort of broad introduction in high performance computing, as I said, the landscape of supercomputing and now I'd like to say a few things that uh, should be uh, helpful for the next courses also, which is um, some points, some considerations when assessing performance of scientific application terms. So we saw this a bit also in a previous slide, but maybe it's good to um, uh, say a few more words about it. So one thing, one thing to introduce is peak floating point rate, which, uh, as I also said before, is the theoretical highest number of floating point operations that can be carried out by a computational unit. And this, the things it depends on, and we'll see something more explicitly in the next slide, but depends on the clock rate of the processor, on what the vector length is, what the floating point units per core, how many floating point units per core are, how many cores are per socket, these considerations. <coughs> and then there's uh, peak bandwidth, which is the theoretical the highest number of bytes that can be read or written from or to some level of memory, for example, level one to three of cache, RAM, etc. Um, so if we're talking about the theoretical peak of RAM, things that this depends on are uh, data rates, the number of channels that are occupied, ranks, banks, these are all things not necessarily that you need to know about, just, just to know the terms that, um, uh, that exist. Um, so it's good to have some idea of these numbers, the peak floating point rate, the peak bandwidths that are, uh, it's good to have a, a, some, some ballpark uh, idea of where those numbers are for the machine that you're using if you want, want to test the performance of your code. Um, so here's just an example. So I took this, I took uh, the processes that are currently found on, on Joules, a supercomputer in Ulix, just as a way to, to have something more specific. So, I mean, you can, you can open and look up what the peak floating point rate, uh, uh, you can Google or look up what the fleet peak floating point rate of the CPUs that are in uh, the specific Intel Xeon model uh, uh, at JAWS is, but um, but uh, often uh, you can actually calculate it because uh, we know, for example, that there are 48 cores per node. You know the clock rate, and uh, if you also know how many floating point operations can be here per clock, then uh, of course, then that's how you can derive the peak floating point rate. So um, in the best case, this, this Intel Xeon system can issue two 512-bit fused multiply nodes per cycle, okay? So there is a ZIMD unit in these cores. There are actually two ZIMD units in these cores, which means that you can pack uh, uh, multiply and then add operation in, and you can do two of these uh, at the in 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 the time it takes to do one cycle of of the processor. 
So if, if these 512 bit uh, uh, units are used to do double precision operations, which are 60, so each double precision number takes up 64 bits, then you could do, again, this is a theoretical peak, 32 floating point operations per cycle. So you multiply that by the cycles per second, so you said 2.7 gigahertz, then you know the peak performance per core, and then 48 cores per node, you get the stated peak performance per node of joules, for example. Now peak bandwidth is a bit more tricky to, to figure out, but again, uh, usually you know uh, at a given frequency and for some number of channels, what the peak uh, IO rate is, and so then you can know that if this has two sockets, then the peak bandwidth should be uh, about 256 gigabytes. And there are some semi-standard tools to pull some of these uh, numbers from the hardware. So for example, on Linux, you can obtain the, at least the processor model and then look up further the details uh, by looking into this uh, device file or you can obtain topology of the memory and know how big the caches are, some details about the, uh, the memory with these tools. Uh, this last one, I think, requires access to devmem, which means you might need root access. But in any case, there are tools uh, and there are ways to know what the peak floating point rate of the um, hardware you're working on is, and also what the peak bandwidth of the hardware you're working on. So, um, as I said before, uh, this should be distinguished. So the peak performance should be distinguished from the peak floating point rate, which is a quantity that is usually measured and is measured for a scientific kernel. And as I said before, usually addition subtraction and multiplication are counted as one flop, whilst other operations are usually larger than uh, one flop and depend on the architecture. Uh, and usually, uh, so if you have simple uh, computational kernels, you can just explicitly count the number of floating point operations in the kernel and divide by the runtime and you arrive at the same performance. But there are also, alternatively, you can you can, uh, if, if your code is more complex, you can use so-called performance counters, which are some hooks you can put in your code, which actually get, or there are registers sometimes on the processor that will tell you how many putting point operations have been carried out within uh, a given time. So in the examples that will follow, um, we will see kernels where we can actually count the number of floating point operations, okay? Um, sustained bandwidth is, as I said before, the measured average bytes that are written from main memory per unit time. And then, um, as this is done, as in the case of the floating point rate, so usually you have a computational kernel and you know how much data you need to read, and how much data you need to write in order to complete the kernel. So then you can know how much bytes of memory have to be read and written from RAM in the given time. And then there are some assumptions, and I'll show some examples of what I mean by these assumptions, which is a, a maximum data reuse assumption that um, you need to make in order to simplify this calculation. Otherwise, it might become uh, a bit too uh, a bit uh, intractable. So just, just to make this a bit more concrete, uh, let's consider uh, an example. Okay, so consider the following kernel. So you have a multi-dimensional array Y, uh, a multi-dimensional array X, and a multi-dimensional array A. Now, um, so uh, the way so the way I want you to think of this is, say you have an, basically an array of small matrices Y, an array of small matrices X, and then you have another small matrix A, which is constant, and you want to you want to multiply all elements of X with a small matrix A. Okay, so it's basically an array 
of matrices multiplied by a matrix going into an array matrix. So what that basically means is in this, is this notation that basically I goes from zero to some uh, number L and then ABC iterate from zero to N. And what I mean by the little matrix A is that N is much smaller than L. So here's the straightforward implementation here, okay. Um, <coughs> this is, uh, this, this uh, is basically C now. Um, of course, you would usually use some allocator rather than doing it like this, but this is just for brevity here. So I'm defining my arrays Y, X, and A. And I am doing uh, uh, the iterations as follows. Now, how many uh, floating point operations does this um, kernel require? So um, you can just, it's probably more easier to, to count them when you actually see the code. So you have an addition here and a multiplication, and this is done n cubed times L times. Right? So it's two times n cubed times L. And then I want to ask what the number of bytes of input and output are memory. And uh, first I prefix this, this is the, so I just put W here to distinguish. So if this were single precision, then W would be four. In this case, it's double precision, so W is eight, but I also parameterize the precision in this case. Um, but basically you need to read in You need to read in all the elements of X once, at least. You need to read in all the elements of A once, at least. And then you need to write out all the elements of Y, at least once. So that becomes the calculation for the number of data that needs to be either read or written uh, to from memory. Um, uh, Okay, if you consider that n is indeed very small, much smaller than n, and this can simplify to just the order L term to Ln square. Now notice what, what I've done um, when I, I counted this, I said that you need to read in x at least once, all the elements of x at least once, and all the elements of y at least once. And uh, that is what I mean by this data reuse assumption, okay? That I that I've used and will typically use in also the examples that follow. So if I just so this is just oops went the wrong way. Okay, so this is just this operation, but I've unrolled the loops. Okay, I've unrolled the loops and I've kept I here just to see what I mean. So you see here that elements of X and A are required multiple times, right? However, when we did the calculation, we only counted the loads once. So that's what I mean by uh, data reuse assumption. So uh, if you measure the runtime of this kernel, then take some time T bar here, then you would define the floating point rate of the kernel now, the sustained floating point rate. And I symbolize this with beta, beta FP as the ratio NFP over T bar. And the IO rate is beta IO is an IO over T bar. Then you see how this motivates defining a, a ratio of these quantities, <coughs> sorry, which um, uh, I define here as the so-called intensity of the kernel. So this is uh, NFP of NIO, and then the time drops out. Uh, so this ratio is, has units or blobs per byte, and it basically tells you um, how many floating point operations are required for each byte of IO are required to push in and out of memory for the given computational kernel. Okay, so, uh, some, some word about these uh, new, new computational kernel intensity that we've um, introduced. As I said, it's the ratio of floating point operations to bytes of IO. In our previous example, right? So if I would do this uh, ratio, here I took the asymptotic form 
<coughs> sorry, of gamma of uh, of, um, of the uh, NFP. So that's two ln cubed, uh, and of the uh, sorry, I took the asymptotic form of uh, of the NIO. Sorry, and uh, I take the ratio here. Then you see that in this case L drops out. So you have a constant IK for a constant M. So it doesn't matter how big our arrays are, uh, the, the uh, intensity is, is a, a sort of a fixed ratio. So if I were doing it for three by three matrices, for example, and again, using double precision as I did before, then I would have an intensity of about 0.37, of exactly 0.375. Now, I can think of a, a node uh, in this uh, sort of uh, cartoon here uh, where I have uh, some uh, memory, right? Uh, I have a, a CPU, it has some cache, and the memory bandwidth, which I sim symbolize with gamma IO, is basically how fast I can push in and out data along this uh, little gray line here. Uh, whereas gamma FP, I can think of uh, in this model, in this, in this cartoon, as how I um, move data around uh, in the CPU. So that's the floating point rate, gamma FP. And in this case, similar to the kernel intensity, I can define a so-called machine uh, flop the byte ratio of machine intensity, which I will call IM. And then uh, if I do this for the system that we talked about before, which was Jules, this Jules node, right? Then I had the, for, for a single node, I would have on the top here that four teraflops, whatever it was, four point something teraflops and 256 gigabytes underneath. And then I come to the, uh, machine intensity of 16.2 flops per byte. Okay, so how do we use now uh, this, um, these two uh, uh, intensities? Well, um, so typically we're looking for a balance between kernel and hardware intensity. So if the kernel intensity is much larger than the machine intensity, then we say that this kernel is compute bound on the given architecture. This means that um, the, uh, uh, the processor, this, uh, this means that the bottleneck is how fast we can uh, do floating point operations. And that a higher floating point rate of the machine would lead to a higher performance, but presumably higher bandwidth to memory would not provide for for a shorter time to solution. Whereas the, in, in, the, in the case of the opposite, uh, if the kernel intensity is much smaller than the machine intensity, we say that the kernel is bandwidth or memory bound on the given architecture. And this means that uh, a higher bandwidth to memory would lead to higher performance, but presumably uh, if we would uh, have uh, uh, higher floating point rate, this will not help. And then uh, when we have a balance, when, when, sorry, the intensities are about the same, then we say that we have a balanced kernel on this architecture. And this is usually <coughs> an ideal scenario. We say that the uh, kernel optimally uses the, the, the underlying architecture. So for the example kernel of the previous slide, so, right? So um, we had a case where IK is much smaller than IM. So that kernel would be memory bound if we would run it on jewels. And I'd like to note again, the assumptions that enter in IK and IM. So this is a bit of a simplified model uh, and makes some simplified considerations. So maybe it's good repeating them. Gamma FP, right? So the peak floating point performance of that Jules node we had as an example, considers that all operations can be a sequence of multiply nodes, right? So, that, so that's the assumption for the peak. Uh, 
beta IO, as I said, assumes this maximum data reuse that you, this, so that's the, um, the bandwidth assuming that you read, that you only need to read each element or write each element of the input and output varies once. Okay, and then we also saw, this is not an assumption, but we also saw that um, in that case, uh, the kernel intensity was independent of the problem size. Um, so L dropped out in the ratio. Okay, so, so given an architecture, right, with a given IM, um, things you need to ask yourself when you're writing an application is can you just look at the source code look at the kernels you're calling and get an estimate at least for the most intensive parts of your of your um, of your code can you get the number of floating point operations and the number of bytes of io for the kernel or the collections of kernels you're calling and can you estimate therefore the computation intensity and then just by comparing the kernel intensity and the machine intensity, you can, you can just get an idea of whether you expect your kernel to be memory or compute bound. Okay, so that's the first thing that, that's the first conclusion you should arrive on when considering a new system or a new architecture. And then um, can you obtain actual measurements of your code running on the system, usually you can, in order to get the sustained floating point rate and the sustained IO, and see a bit what the ratios are. And then this analysis should guide sort of the overall strategy uh, when developing or when you want to optimize uh, applications for performance. So if the kernel is memory bound, you should be trying to optimize uh, memory I.O. And if the kernel is compute bound, you should be trying to optimize the floating point rate. In reality, these two things are very intertwined and optimizing for one optimizes for the other. So it's, it's not as, uh, let's say, compartmentalized as I'm making it seem here maybe, but that's, these are some uh, common, let's say, uh, strategies deployed when uh, considering a, a writing a code for a given architecture. Okay, and so the last thing I want to talk about, and maybe uh, I can, and and maybe and not maybe, and we will revisit some of this uh, uh, in the beginning maybe of the next um, lecture is uh, some strategies followed. So some, so some of these I will sort of briefly outline here to give you an idea. And then, uh, what, and then we will also look at them in some uh, practical exercises, uh, probably in less, in, in less than three. So what I want to, do is just uh, show you some node level considerations when uh, uh, trying to optimize kernels, um, given what I've said so far about intensities um, and whether a kernel is compute bound or floating point bound. Okay, so the first and simplest thing you can do is uh, multi-threading and uh, the reason I'm showing this here is because I haven't really talked a bit about, you know, uh, multi-core processes in this picture. So <coughs> um, I, I introduced this cartoon of a, of a processor uh, in a couple of slides ago. Um, and now I want to talk about what this looks like when you actually have more than one cores uh, uh, on a given, uh, let's say, node. So... Uh, Okay, here I'm going from one to three. Uh, you know, we talked about, for example, Joule's node before the supercomputer at ULIC, which has 48 cores. But um, in general, uh, what you achieve, what you, what you have, let's say, um, when you have a 
a multi-core node is you are basically multiplying uh, the, 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 the gamma, the gamma FP, so that the peak floating point performance in this way. So you can see this uh, sort of trivially here. Um, whereas, uh, okay, you would, so you would think that this gamma IO uh, is the same whether you're using one core or multiple cores. Okay, now um, using more cores seems to only help when you have a compute bound kernel, right? So when your uh, IK is bigger than IM, the intensity of the kernel is bigger than the intensity of M. And indeed, um, in that case, uh, using more cores uh, will help because you're effectively multiplying gamma FP. But modern uh, node designs hmm, uh, do not, are not, uh, do not saturate uh, gamma IO, so the, the potential memory bandwidth just by using one core or a few cores, right? So many of the architectures require that you use more uh, or all of the cores in order to saturate and achieve peak uh, gamma IO. So also in those cases, right, even if you have a memory bound kernel, then uh, using more using more cores uh, will give you better saturation of gamma IO and so will give you will lead to better IO performance. Okay, another uh, thing uh, is so-called virtualization, which enables the use in your code of specialized SIMD hardware. And we talked about this before, but I'll also show some examples and the slides follow. And uh, this, again, might seem like you're uh, optimizing for floating point performance, but indeed, sometimes if you have, a, most, a lot of times if you have a code that is uh, capable of exploiting uh, these ZIMD units, then this also benefits the efficient loading and storing of memory. And then something that you uh, can do is various data layout transformations. So transformations for mitigation of so-called cache misses, which basically means improve the, uh, uh, the temporal and spatial locality. So things like blocking and tiling your data. And I'll explain a bit what this means uh, in the next slides. And uh, transformations which actually exist, assist uh, uh, vectorization, okay? So I, I've introduced these two vectorization and data lay transformations, and I'll, and maybe here uh, I've sort of outlined them, and I'd like to explain a bit with some examples of what I mean by each. So, so for vectorization, what we mean to exploit ZIMD units is um, well, mo well, most modern processors have uh, some so-called vectorization capabilities. And this come by, you know, a range of names. So SSE and AVX are just the terms <coughs> used by Intel for these special operations. Altivec and QPX are used by IBM Power. Um, and then NEON is, is something that's specific to ARM. So these are units that allow single instruction, multiple data operations. What do I mean by that? So um, if you consider this, this uh, operation here, very simple kernel. You have an array X and an array Y. You want to multiply X by a scalar, each element of X by a scalar, add it to Y, put it back in Y. Okay. So I can unroll this for you here on the right. Uh, so if I write every four iterations, then you get something like this. And what uh, what these what a processor has these these um as I said, special hardware for doing is basically what it can do is it can do these four operations in one go. So it can put a, a, a vector, it has a special register, so a special part of the processor, a special uh, part of its uh, uh, storage, 
which uh, fits for, let's say, for the sake of argument, four of these at a time and four of these X's at a time. So it issues a special interrupt instruction to load four of these like this. And then it does this operation in uh, with one instruction, okay? And this might take as few as one cycle uh, in the processor, whereas before this would take four cycles or more in this case. And then it can store back the vector, okay? So, <coughs> so I'm using, <coughs> excuse me. So I'm using pseudocode here, of course, okay? So um, some of these instructions are fake and I just made them up here, uh, but this is just to, to illustrate um, uh, how these uh, uh, vector instructions work. And so in many cases, the compiler will just see this loop that you wrote here. So the trivial loop I wrote in the first time and we'll see the opportunity to use these kind of instructions and we'll do it, okay? But for more complicated kernels where it's not so obvious where the opportunities are, um, it might be necessary that you actually in your program adjust the data layout so the way that the data is stored in order to assist this vectorization, okay? So sort of nicely and neatly line up the arrays so that the, that the compiler can see that the loop that you're trying to do is actually vectorizable in this case and use these MD registers. So data layer transformations are a bit general purpose uh, and what they can allow for is uh, easier vectorization. So uh, this is what I said before. Um, so the data is ordered, so you transform your kernel so that the data is ordered such that the same operation can be applied to consecutive elements. And this can assist the compiler to detect auto vectorization opportunities, or if this fails, it will assist you as a programmer, if necessary, to use so-called vector intrinsics. So use, I went one slide back now, so use special purpose uh, variables and functions like this, which explicitly tell uh, the compiler to, to do this. Okay, uh, but then you can achieve better cache locality. And what this means is that you can achieve with via these data layer transformations that the data are ordered in a way as close to the order in which they will be accessed uh, in your kernels as possible. Uh, and the data are reordered such that when an element needs to be accessed multiple times, these multiple accesses happen <coughs> very close to each other so that this variable does not need to be retrieved multiple times. So um, these two are referred to respectively as temporal and spatial locality. Okay, so uh, apart from data layout transformations that can assist vectorization, you can also do transformations to achieve better cache locality. So um, one uh, very high level example uh, that is used to, to show this data to locality, to these, sorry, data layout transformations, how they can help is um, uh, in, in the simple dense matrix, matrix multiplication. So um, if you have a, a matrix, matrix multiplication such as this one, okay, so I wrote in a trivial uh, code here, a trivial kernel that will do this matrix, matrix multiplication. If you look at the access patterns, right? So how are you accessing the data? So I've written the matrix A here as a one dimensional array and I'm indexing it in lexicographically in this way and I'm indexing also B lexicographically in this way. And if you want to ask you know, how are you, as I said, accessing the data, then basically what you're doing um, when you're doing this um, iteration over K is you're running doing the dot product of this row first with this 
sorry, darker red column. And then you're accessing again the row A with the second column. So you're basically accessing multiple times row A. And if your matrix is large enough that this that the whole of the row A cannot be kept in cache, then you might be reading A multiple times. Another thing you're doing is that you are basically so striding when you're reading B. So because you're reading B column wise, you are jumping, you know, over memory because uh, B is stored uh, um, with consecutive uh, uh, column elements uh, uh, in memory. So a common strategy to improve the data access when uh, doing matrix matrix multiplication is so-called okay here we are this so-called uh, well blocking or tiling sometimes called so this basically means um, that you you break up the uh, matrix into blocks or tiles and then you you multiply a block or or a tile at a time then an additional thing you can do is you can uh, transpose uh, a B while you're at it, since you're copying in each iteration here um, the, uh, the 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 each individual tile of A and B. Um, you can also transpose so that now you can see that. That was before and this is after so you can see that these now are small matrices so repeated retrieval of a and b can probably stay into to cache but also that their memory is uh, that you you achieve better alignment in memory and so that this code is easier to vectorize by the compiler along the uh, this uh, uh, index here, this this iteration here, KB. So I'm going a bit fast here just to introduce some of these concepts, but we'll see them a bit more carefully uh, in in the next courses where we'll also do some practical exercises on these. So another kind of uh, data layout transformation that we will, as I said, look at closely is transforming arrays of structures to structures of arrays. So um, it's it's common in a code to define a structure a bit like this. Let's say you want this, you want an array of coordinates. So you define a structure which has an X, Y, and Z element, and then you allocate some memory which has L of these coordinates. And then if you want to do an operation like, I don't know, like maybe get the sum of the squares of each element, um, what, the, the way that this uh, uh, structure, array of structures will be laid out in memory is that X, Y, and Z components of each elements will be next to each other in memory. And so if you want to do an operation such as the one that I'm showing here, then this is not nicely aligned to take advantage of, you know, vectorization. So, one common uh, data layout transformation is to go from an array of structures to a structure of arrays, which is to mean that instead of defining the structure as before, you would define uh, a structure of pointers and then allocate contiguously all x elements, contiguously all y elements, and contiguously all z elements. And in that way, you facilitate the compiler of um, picking up the vectorization opportunity and luckily we'll actually do this with the ZIMD units. Okay. As I said, um, I'm introducing these a bit fast now, but we'll see some applications later. And the last thing I want to talk about was might be a bit more relevant for, uh, for, for us as lattice field theorists is in in, in the case of stencil codes, usually you have, you know, some 
I don't know, some, some point split operations like these ones. So in this case, this looks a bit like a Laplacian. And this is how you would implement this uh, in uh, sort of a straightforward uh, C code. And if I were to unroll at least the X coordinate here, so the fastest running index, then I would get something like this. So you see that now the operations don't really align. So here I have, uh, I have four elements starting from X and ending at X plus three, but then I have, uh, I have another four elements that start one offset, all right? And then I have offset by a different direction here. And then here I go to, to completely a different place in memory to get the neighbor of Y. So this is another example which doesn't nicely align in memory and I uh, cause the compiler to not see a vectorization opportunity. So one common data layout strategy, so the top one here is just what I had in the previous slide. So this, this snippet, up here is just a copy from the previous slide, just to keep it for reference. Um, so an alternative is to change the data layout so that we vectorize over distant elements, right? So uh, you can think of reshaping the data layout in a way where you split the slowest running index into two components like this. And so now, <coughs> if you write out the uh, stencil operation, then it will look uh, something like this, where these VAs now are this new data layout. And you can see that all elements nicely align. And this would be something that uh, the compiler would be more likely to pick up and vectorize. Okay, so this is a detail that we'll also see next time but you still need to do something special on the boundaries, but that's just um, on uh, each column of the boundary. And so it shouldn't affect performance too much. Okay, um, so that's what I think, what I wanted to say uh, for today as a, as a bit of a, a, an introduction and also to to introduce some things that we will see a bit more carefully next time. Um, and just, uh, okay, just to keep you uh, a bit busy, this shouldn't be too much. I have two, two example kernels that maybe you want to practice a bit. Uh, some of the things that we talked about, not everything, but some of the concepts that we introduce. So I have two example kernels that you can exercise in computing their intensity. So the first is, uh, if you just consider the matrix matrix multiplication, the uh, so dense matrix matrix multiplication, um, if you can just figure out what NFP and NIO of this is uh, as a function of the matrix's dimensions, uh, you know, uh, do uh, the, the little exercise and identify when when this kernel is compute bound and when this kernel is memory bound, for example, using jewels as the reference architecture. And then do the same thing for uh, this operation here, which is the complex, uh, um, this is this uh, AX plus Y, A scalar times X vector plus Y vector. But in the case that each, all of these are uh, double precision complex numbers, right? So what is NFP? What is NIO? What are the intensities? And will this kernel be compute or uh, memory bound uh, on, on jewels? Okay, and um, I'd be happy also to answer any questions that you have now in the remaining five or so minutes. I don't know, how does this work? Can anybody speak? Or how does today? Thanks, Yanni. Yeah. If uh, there are any questions, please.
comments, questions. Corrections. I'm sure there are corrections. Uh, but not necessarily related to what we've talked about, but you mentioned there might be more practical um, things, like especially in the later talks. Is there any specific software we should make sure we have installed so that we can do that? Like, is there anything in particular, like any particular compilers or anything? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thanks for asking that. So uh, I will send something to Petros to distribute. Um, so rather than just saying now uh, the, um, rather than just saying now what to do, maybe it's better to send some instructions, but basically just, just the outline is for those who know what they're doing at least um, if you have uh, if you have like a Mac or if you're on Linux, then I will ask you to have a GNU compiler and op which can also compile OpenMP or an LLVM compiler, which can compile OpenMP, and then a Python uh, implementation that can do matplotlib, so that's all things. And if you're a Windows user, I will send some information on how to do this using this um, subsystem, Windows subsystem for Linux or Windows Linux subsystem, that I remember. Um, some instructions so that you can also have available uh, GNU compiler, OpenMP and be able to uh, do matplotlib um, plots. So if you already have that on your computers, then you don't need to do anything. If you don't, then you will receive some instructions. All right, perfect. Thank you. Any other question? Maybe since since Petro, since this came up, I don't know. Maybe whoever didn't whoever is ready, so given what I said, whoever knows what I'm talking about and is ready, maybe if they can raise their hands. And then we can see who hasn't raised their hands. That would be just an interesting poll for me. Is, is that possible? Okay, it's hidden. Has to, has to declare it in the chat. Let's count. Yeah, I just like to see what what percentage would actually need to do this for the first yeah. time. How do how do you want us to implement a poll over Zoom? I'm not entirely sure how to do that. Right. Uh, so if you if you if you understand what I talked about and you're you're prepared, then you can raise your hand. And I'll just see how many hands are not raised by the end. Sorry, if if we have like uh, MPI and all of this on, on our laptops, that's what you're asking. Not a, not MPI, Open MP. Open MP, sorry. And the GNU or LLVM compiler that can compile OpenMP and a Python that can write matplotlib figures. Okay. Has it to be on our on our laptops or can we use um, machines we assess by remote, for example? Right. Okay. So if you know what you're doing and you can access a remote machine and you can do that during the lesson, then that's also perfectly fine with me. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so more than half will need to do this, okay. But have you got the feedback? I didn't see anything. Yeah, I can see if I click on the participants on the top, or I don't know where it is. Yeah. For me, it's there's a um, participants. Uh, for me, I do not have ah, a raise okay. hand. I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I do not have a raise hand button, or at least I am oh. not clever enough to find it. <laughs> yeah, I also uh -huh. haven't got a chance to raise my hand. I don't know why, probably because I'm the host. So, uh -huh. Oh, I see. Then this might not be representative. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'll send the instructions. We won't, we probably won't need to do this 
next time anyway. So next time we can get some feedback on who hasn't managed to you know, do this and see how we go from there. Yeah, maybe people that are not ready now, uh, after I, I, I will have a distributed uh, the document you sent me, then they, yeah. they, they, they prepare themselves. And okay. They will have the time in 10 days to do it, right? Yeah, so this will be, well, yeah, I mean, it, it will be good if people can let us know by the next course if they've managed or not. Um, uh, but but it won't but so that we can prepare for the third lesson which is where we will need to do this okay right so ideally i have to say ideally we would do this on a common system but this is not really possible also because we're remote so becomes logistically difficult to give everybody access to the same system. Uh, but let's see how it works on each person's laptop. Be interesting to see the different results. Right. Okay. So any questions? I'm still, I mean, I know we're a bit over time, but I would still. Oh, it's okay. I will still take some questions if there are any. Okay. Um, you mentioned vectorization. So is there a way to f enforce this and not let the compiler decide? So is there some data structure for it? You only use pseudo code. So I was wondering, is there a way to implement this? In yes. Yeah, okay, it's a good question. So yeah, so in most cases, um, this is architecture specific. Yeah, sorry, take back in most cases. So this is architecture specific. And in most cases, um, the C implementation, right, will expose some uh, variables on the given architecture, uh, some variables and some functions. Um, which uh, which you can use. So if I just, uh, I think I can use this. So can you still see my, can you still see my browser window? Yeah, you can still see that. So for example, if I look for, um, um, if you look for Intel intrinsics, so that's for Intel, for example. So, okay, I'm doing this in real time. So this might be, Okay, so this is a list of functions so the, that are available to you to actually exploit, use these, uh, so explicitly tell the compiler to use these, these operations. Um, so there's a, for Intel, there's a nice reference. If you want to enforce it, oh, let me see, let me try and give you an example. Uh, Okay, so for example, this, this function here, you, you need to learn to read these things, but um, uh, basically, if, if you put, this does uh, a fuse multiply and add. So I think what it'll do, it'll multiply A and B and add C using the special registers uh, that Intel has in its chips, right? And so if you use this, if you, if you use any of these functions, then these functions will probably not work when you take your code to, I don't know, ARM or something, even though you're using the same compiler. Or if you take your code to power PC, for example, power uh, nine architecture. So this code will, will break hmm, if you enforce it like this. But on an Intel uh, uh, machine, which has a compiler which understands how these map to the, you know, to the given assembly or binary code, put by code uh, of the machine, then it will use them explicitly. Okay, thanks.
and yeah, they're basically doing yeah. So they're not as pretty. They're not as pretty as the pseudocode I invented here. 